Hey, welcome everyone to the From the Shadows podcast. I'm your host, Shane Grove. And before we get started with this uh, this episode, I just want to remind everybody that if you want to uh, check us out on Facebook, you can find us at From the Shadows podcast, or you can go to our forum page, After the Shadows. You can find me at Shane Grove Author on Instagram, or our From the Shadows podcast Instagram page, or the good old-fashioned way, just go to fromtheshadowspodcast.com, hit the contact button. You could send me an email, tell me about an experience you may have, tell me how I have a face made for radio. If you're watching on YouTube, whatever it is you want to do, I'll read it. I'll enjoy it. Well, unless you really do say I have a face for, for radio. Anyway, We'll get through it, no matter what you said. No matter what you said. So reach out if you got a story you want to share on the air. We'd love to hear it. Um, and if you really, really want some extra content, um, we've got some extra content up on Patreon. There's different levels you can join and you get the episodes a little bit early, commercial free, and then there's some some extra episodes um, every now and then. So with that being said. Uh, on this frigid night in Ohio, which I'm recovering from my day job, um, so thankfully you guys can't see uh, see how blue the rest of my body is from being out in the cold all day. Um, we're going to heat it up with a really, really great, as far as a listener goes, encounter. Uh, I don't know if the guy telling the story thinks it's so great in the in, yeah, in the moment or afterwards but brian welcome to the from the shadows podcast thank you shane so so brian i'm just gonna let you get into your story um you can tell you know as much detail as about is about where this took place as you want but it's all yours go for it Thank you. Well, Shane, I live in a very small village here in Ohio, uh, about 45 miles southwest of Cleveland. Let's just leave it at that. Village of about 150 people or less. Um, I have been employed uh, in the medical profession for 35 years, just retired today, uh, officially, anyway. Oh, congr congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it was nice. Um, but my 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 encounter was actually a two part encounter, and it occurred December two thousand five. And I can't tell you the exact day. I I would be lying if I said that, but I know it was in the beginning. And that December it was cold, very, oh, cold like most December's anyway. Um, it uh, there was a dusting of snow on the ground. Not much more than that. Ground was frozen solid. And uh, sound asleep. And then I kept hearing this noise. Now, outside, I had a wolf Malamute hybrid dog. And if you know anything about the Malamute, they don't like to be inside. They enjoy the snow. So he was outside. And I kept hearing a thunk noise, thunk, thunk. So I got up and I walked to the uh, French doors in my bedroom and looked out. And... My dog's name was Wolf, of course, and I noticed that he had his head down and he kept thunking that chain, just pulling tightly on it. I got dressed, grabbed my flashlight, and I walked outside. Well, most December nights after midnight, they're clear, cold, quiet, not much going on. And uh, as I approached Wolf, I noticed that he had his head down his tail down almost between his legs, except the hair on the back of his neck, his hackles were up. He was, he was sensing something, and he kept pulling at that chain. As I was approaching him and talking to him, I heard a noise I will never forget. It was unlike anything I'd ever heard. Now, living where I live, there's woods and fields within five minutes walking direction from anywhere in my house. Anywhere. Um, and anyway, I, I heard this sound. It sounded like a resonant howl, like a dog was stuck in a barrel. Well, the town had just started putting in new culverts, and I thought maybe an animal, a dog, got stuck in one of these culverts. 
I went back in the house, grabbed a little heavier coat, grabbed a, a million candle watt spotlight and my 45. And I started walking toward where the culvert was. Now, from where I lived then to where the culvert is, maybe 300, 350 yards. Uh, empty fields, not much. But about every maybe minute, two minutes, this howl would let out. Again, it was just, it, it was it was insane. It was something that was just unnerving. Well, as I started walking along this field toward where one of the culverts were by the house, uh, I realized that the noise wasn't coming from the culvert. It was coming from the woods behind the then mayor's house. I went ahead and I made my way down the field to a little hillside, started down the hill. There's a road that only runs to the east. And I noticed that the mayor, the then mayor's husband, raised, uh, he had three hunting dogs. And these dogs were in their, in their dog houses. Two of them were just shaking beyond belief. The other one was outside trying to dig through frozen ground to get under his house. Well, I looked down at the 45 in my hand and I realized that that wasn't big enough. So I ran back to the house and I, uh, if you know firearms at all, I got my gun safe and I grabbed out an HK-91. It had night vision on it. And uh, the magazine I grabbed was a uh, alternated stacking full metal jacket and armor piercing rounds. And I started back out. My then wife asked me what I was doing. She was from the city. And I told her, I said, there's something going on outside, some noise which I've never heard. She walked outside trying to convince me to come back inside, and it was nothing when she heard this thing howl. She fell against the house and slid down, asking me, oh, my God, what is it? And I said, I honestly don't know. So I went, started back toward where I heard this noise coming from. I went ahead and crossed the road and across the ditch line into the that uh, mayor's then house yard. And I walked past the kennel where they had their dogs. And the distance from where I was standing to the tree line was maybe 35 yards, maybe. And I'm shining this spotlight in the woods. I'm just looking around trying to see what it is I was hearing. It, it, the sound was at that time of night and the still and the silence, it was deafening. And all of a sudden, this something started charging through the woods, just breaking branches as it came. Well, I slammed the bolt shut on that HK-91, and it's a heavy thing. It makes a big, big pounding sound of metal as it shuts. And that thing stopped. It recognized the sound of a bolt on a gun. I, 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 I couldn't believe it. So now I'm looking into the woods, and I'm looking at my height, about five feet, well, five and a half feet, and I'm following, I'm not seeing anything, I'm just seeing darkness, and I'm following, I started moving the light up the tree, the tree line. And about seven, seven and a half feet were these eyes attached to this, you know, um, This thing had the head, head of a dog, head of a wolf, uh, and amberish red eyes, and it was just staring at me. And I'm standing there staring at it, and I'm watching it breathe. I can see the steam rising from its, from its muzzle. And we stood there just looking at each other. I don't know, it seemed quite a long time. But the feeling I got from it when I was standing there was malevolence, pure evil. Nothing like I'd ever seen before. I'm, I'm tr I, I, I was trying to wrap my head around what I was looking at. And I, I just couldn't, I couldn't believe it. This thing then turned and 
to the to the to the to the west and ran. It, it ran 150 yards in five seconds. It ran through the woods, up a hill, and crossed uh, a state route. It was un unlike anything I'd ever seen. I, I couldn't believe it. I still, I, to look at this thing, to, to imagine this thing, this is something I have thought about nearly every single day since then. I spent my youth hiking and spending a lot of time in the woods. I enjoyed going there because it was a nice way to reset. And I, I just couldn't believe it. So I went back home. And when I say this story is two part, and I'll, I'll follow that up here in a second. The, uh, the next night when my then wife came home, uh, I turned on something for her and I said, what does this sound like? And the closest thing I had to what I heard I played on the TV while she stayed in the kitchen was the howl from the American Werewolf in London, in London while it was on the moors. And she turned white and sat down. She goes, that's, that's about it. She goes, it was real close to that. Now, a month later, mid January of 2006, uh, second, third week, uh, we were having a snowstorm come through. Of course, you know how how is, mm -hmm. you know, they say you're going to get a snowstorm and you get a dusting or you get three feet. You're not really sure what <laughs> something in between. That's, that's just how it goes. But it was supposed to be bitter cold. Um, and we live here in the winter. Why? I don't I don't know. What? Well, yeah, I, I, I don't like Florida. So, you know, I, you know I'm good. <laughs> I don't like the humidity. Yeah. But, uh, you know. Shane, I, I took that dog, my dog Wolf, and I put him in the garage. Now, the garage is a detached garage, um, 15 yards, 15 yards from the house, probably. And I put him in there with some straw, and it's a big garage. And I wanted to make sure he was okay. And this was on a Friday. The next morning, 9 o'clock-ish, the sun was out, cold, still very cold. And I thought, I'm going to go out and check on Wolf, let him out. Uh, give him some water, you know, whatever. And as I walked out and started walking down the sidewalk to this detached garage, I, I was looking at the, at the garage and I noticed that there was, there was tracks back and forth in the snow along the garage. And I'm, I, I, it was just like pushed down. The snow was just pushed down. Like you could tell something had been walking there. And as I started to take a few more steps, I looked down in front of me. And there were these tracks. And if you have ever watched the Dogman Triangle by, uh, I, I think, I, I'm not sure, Seth Breedlove, I think he did that maybe. Yeah, Small Town the, Monsters with yeah, right, Aaron Small Town Monsters. Case. Right, yeah. They, at the beginning of that, they talk about what you might run into in Texas. And then this, the music gets a little darker. And they said, they watch out for the Dogman. And all of a sudden, these tracks come up on the screen on the left lower part of the screen. That's what was in the snow, standing outside my house. Well, I, I, I had never seen anything like this. I went and got my neighbor, and he's about 15 years older than I am, outdoorsman, avid outdoorsman. And then I asked Gary if he'd seen anything like this. He goes, he'd never seen anything like that in all of his life. Well, we had just had a meeting at the uh, at local gun club by the Ohio DNR uh, officer that was for our county. We were talking, they were talking about poaching things. He passed out his card. He and I talked a bit. I, I called his card and it just so happened that he was in uh, a, a, a small town, not too far from here. So he'd stop by and he was here within probably 35 minutes and he gets out and he looks at these tracks and he goes, Brian, I have never seen anything like this. I don't even know what that is. He took a couple pictures. I took pictures. I wish I had the phone still. That was before the cloud. But these tracks were eight feet apart by pedal. Like something was, when, when it turned, when they were standing still, like looking at the house, and it, it turned, and it just like it was hopping on, 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 on just one foot to the next foot to the next foot to the next foot away from, uh, when, away from the house. And this thing got on the railroad tracks, and my son, my oldest son, uh, who uh, 
as a former Marine. And uh, he was 12 at the time. He and I walked up to the railroad tracks and we tracked that thing for probably about a mile down those railroad tracks until I lost it. And if you've ever tried to track anything down the railroad tracks and trains go by, they blow the snow inside the track itself. And this thing being able to jump as far as it did, I just I just lost it on the hillside somewhere. But that thing had scented me. From the from the time before, it followed me to my house. I have never seen anything like that. Never, 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 ever have I seen something that evil. And I know it was corporeal because there was tracks in the snow. And when I watched it breathe, you could see the steam rise from its head, from its snout. It was a corporeal being. Now, whether this thing moves between dimensions i don't know i talked to linda godfrey about it and said on a few occasions i actually went to the uh the first annual dog man seminar that was down in defiance a few years ago and i met some of the other uh crypto pr- crypto people and talked to a few of them you know johnny Oteni is one of them i talked to him a little bit and you know linda's linda's idea of the um native american um aspect to this within and in the cemeteries you know the cemeteries burial grounds native american within probably five miles of this little village there's at least a dozen cemeteries and a lot of them are very old and if you know a little bit about house history you know the five tribes five tribes of indians they call them the five tribes. Some of them were down here where I live. Um, could there be burial grounds here? Who knows? You know, I know a lot of farmers that over the years, you know, they neglected land. You know, they they weren't going to mm-hmm. stop, you know, farming based upon hearsay. So, you know, if they didn't know for sure, they're not going to say, oh, yeah, here's a here's a burial ground. We're not going to farm this. That They didn't really know they were going to continue farming. So is that a possibility here? Yeah, I, I imagine it is. But uh, but never have I seen anything like it. Now, I think I mentioned to you that just a few months ago, my girlfriend, who is also in the medical profession, who was uh, a NICU nurse, uh, she was taking care of a small child that just had a heart transplant. She was on her way home at night. And... Uh, there's a bridge that crosses um, that goes over top of um, an annex of the Black River. Uh, I think it's the uh, Buckhorn Creek. And as she was approaching this bridge about 1030 at night, she saw something standing on the side of the bridge and she slowed down. And I had, you know, we've had conversations about cryptids and whatever. And she was just, she stopped. And she said, here is this thing that's standing there. It's, it had amber eyes. It looked like a giant dog. She goes, it had matted fur. It looked like it was wet. And she goes, it acted like it wanted her to see it. Now, she's an empath. And maybe it did. But she said, i sitting here looking at this in disbelief. And when she came through the door that evening, she was extremely pale. And she she could barely get out what she had seen. Um, she said it actually leaped off the bridge. I said, you mean, did it jump into the ditch line? She goes, no, no, it jumped off the bridge into the creek. That's 25 feet, 20 feet anyway. And no person's going to do that. No person's going to jump into the water from the top of the bridge. Just not going to happen. Uh, so if this thing is, you know, it changed how I. It changed how I go in the woods. I you know I didn't go in the woods at night, even though I had spent most of my teenage years in the woods, hiking and just basically hiking day or night. It didn't matter. I didn't go back in the woods at night for two years. I wouldn't do it. I do now. Well, so, so now you have a better understanding of what you saw, but back in 2005, what, cause Dogman wasn't 
a real, you know, well-known cryptid. Um, I mean, as far as I can, as far as I can remember, I mean, I think I remember hearing about it, but in 2005, though, what did you think you were seeing? I mean, because because no, Dogman I mean, wouldn't have been a uh, wouldn't have been something that popped in your head, right? No, werewolf popped into my head. Yeah, you know, because you're looking at yeah, not Dogman, but you know, werewolf because that's what it looked like. And here is this giant dog wolf head, pointy ears, uh, amber red eyes. And he's staring at me and I'm staring at it and I'm watching him breathe. And I, I'm, I, 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 it's still hard to get your head around that you're actually seeing this, that this is actually something that's real. If I hadn't seen the steam coming out of its, out of its snout, out of its mouth, watching it and watching it take this breath in and out and in and out. And I, I thought I'd be hallucinating, but then to see the tracks in the snow too. No, I knew I wasn't hallucinating. I so, been cold. so when it took off running, it was on two feet the whole time. It never, it never got down on all four. Never dropped the four. What I saw, I only saw, again, it was so fast. I watched it for a flash from what I watched as it ran away. It was on two feet and at a speed I had never seen in an animal before. Now, I have seen bears in the wild. I have seen mountain lions. I have seen bobcat. I've seen wolves. No, this wasn't anything like that. No. Yeah, especially, especially on two feet. You know, mo on two feet. most, I mean, at the night, in, at nighttime in the woods, most humans aren't going to take off running through the woods, you know, and do it very fast. You know, the way it, the way it ran through uh, the brush, the it, I, I can see it as plain as if, if it happened yesterday. Um, the way it, it the way it ran through that brush, those trees. It, 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 it was it was like unfazing and it was it was fast. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen on two feet. So, so, so this just I was thinking as you were telling the story. So as you got out getting closer to where you thought it was did it keep making that noise or yeah. once now did no, it stop it, once once i got to the area when once i got behind where those dogs had been in a kennel it stopped it stopped so, that it was like every couple minutes it was howling maybe every maybe every three but once I got behind the kennel, it stopped. And so, I was I was just waiting. So it's, all, it's almost like I hear that. And it's almost like it was trying, like it knew those dogs in the neighborhood were there. And it was like trying to lure a dog or something out into the woods. And once some something came out there that wasn't a dog that was, a, you know, you were packing some pretty good heat. <laughs> and it it probably rethought its position a little bit, you know, because because there is that there is that school of thought from some eyewitnesses that have we've heard have taken shots and know they've hit these things. And it doesn't you know, they they do leave it, but it doesn't seem to hurt them, you know, so it must have some sort of effect to, for them to get hit with a with a bullet. Right. But it's, but it's almost like once like it was trying to get dog dog or something else to come out and investigate or maybe somebody that didn't have a gun. And it's almost like once it saw you, it was like, ooh, OK, maybe I'll just uh, see if this guy goes away. <laughs> this guy goes away. <laughs> yeah. I, I When when I when it started running through the woods toward me and I shut the boat on this. Like I said, this is a this is an HK ninety one, um, you know the G three, quote unquote. Um, it's a very heavy bolt, and when I did that, it stopped, like it recognized the sound, and that's when I you know I'm looking at this candle watt this million candle watt spotlight, and I'm shining this thing you know in the brush. It, again, at my eye level, and I'm not seeing anything, and then I follow. I just go up. 
I just took the, the spotlight and went up. And when I went up, I caught the eyes. And then I'm looking at the eyes. And I'm looking at the head. And I'm like, again, what am I looking at? And 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 to see it stare at me, and, you know, it dropped its head down to look at me. And, you know, to see the breath coming out of its snout. And, and he's looking at me and I'm looking at him. But again, the the what i felt was again malevolence there was nothing you know people talk about bigfoot and they talk about it being you know more benevolent you know nothing nothing mm-hmm. horrible sometimes you know it's more curious you know it walks through this was not like that this thing the only thing i felt with that was a sense of evil and that it, was it. in <clears throat> And so a couple things there jump out, like that's a typical, a lot of times in a Bigfoot encounter, once it see, once it sees or figures out that somebody has a weapon, it kind of changes its, you know, attitude a little bit. Like, you know, I'm going to, you put your weapon down and I'm just going to get out of here. Right. You know, sometimes that's what, you know, you hear, but, but you also sit there and think, you saw how fast that thing ran away. Think about if that wanted to run at you. Right. Like you yeah, might, I mean, there, there, there's would, no time. Would you, would you get one shot off, maybe? Maybe. And maybe. you better hope you better hope you'd hit. So so it makes you wonder then what the what the barrier is for this thing. Um because if it's that big and that fast and that physically superior to us. Uh, which they always, it always sounds like they are. I don't, I, I've never heard of a, anybody encountering a Bigfoot or a dog man that, you know, was walking with a limp and, you know, had glasses because he couldn't see, you know, like had any kind right. of physical impairment. They all, they seem no. superior physically. So what is it that keeps, you know, what, what is it about, like, especially these dog man creatures that, keep them from just tearing people limb for limb because it seems like they could it, it's almost like they want to um when it comes to humans they just kind of want to know, let you know we're here and and you know there's nothing you can do about it you know well, shane honestly you know, people come at missing all the time they come at missing in 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 force the 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 uh uh, the state parks, the, the the federal federal lands, you know. If you've watched um, uh, the four one one missing of, of a lot Pilates, of hunters, yeah. right? Exactly. You know, and these people were hunters. These were these people were um, professional outdoorsmen. I mean, they knew what they were doing, and yet they come up missing. And there was nothing found of these people. You know, who's to say? It, I'm not going to say yes. I'm not going to say no. You know, that would have to be more uh, more research done into that uh, to find out really what happened. Who's to say these haven't taken people? Don't know. I mean, at the speed that they can move, you really wouldn't have a chance. Now, I, I have I have heard that Polites has kind of he's kind of like in some of these documentaries kind of led us to think that he's on the in the Bigfoot dogman camp but it's almost not. i think it's he thinks it's almost like extraterrestrial really yeah you know <laughs> yeah. even but even still i mean even with i mean we don't know enough about these cryptids to say that maybe they can or cannot move through dimensions. Mm-hmm. I mean, we yeah. know there's more than one dimension. We don't live, I mean, even our world, it's not one dimensional. There's look around you, right? So there's more than one dimension. Could, in fact, these things be able to move through dimension? I don't, I don't know. Is it a possibility? I can't, I don't think anybody can rule that out. I mean, they have to eat something because they are corporeal. You know, as I said, I did see footprints. I did see this thing breathing. I could see the steam rising from it. Um, People have said they've shot these things with little or no effect, but 
where do they go? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, that's uh, those are those are like que- those are questions. I Good don't questions, know, right? I, I don't know that we're. Yeah, it, but you know, I know so, have some listeners out there that um, if they went to YouTube and typed in "strange noise heard in Canada," I, I still don't believe they've identified that. That was about the exact noise that I heard that night. And we'll put and, a, we'll put a link yeah. up to that in our in the show description, the one that you sent me, yeah. and and just so people can go check it out, like go check it out yeah. what what it is. Um, that you, you know, sounds like what you heard now. Yep. Uh, so the, so the next day or the, you know, when you found the footprints, right. So, so the footprints are walking around the garage initially where your dog was. Yes. Right? Yeah. So it's almost right. like it was seeing, can I get, you know, can I get to this thing? I'm hungry. Yep. And and then you follow that's when, then when it left is when you followed like the eight foot leaps. Right. It, looked like. well, it, walked, it walked along the, the garage I knew, but then it had walked from the garage up to the sidewalk that I was standing on and was standing there staring at the house. And that's when it turned after, at a, you know, it was it was probably. Oh, crap, maybe 15 feet from my back door. And it turns then, and then it went from there. And these tracks were, again, about eight feet apart. They were bipedal, and it was just like it hopped. This, you know, like if you were to hop in the snow, that's what these things, it was like a footprint here, eight feet there was one there, and it was like one over there, right up to the railroad tracks, and it headed uh, east. So so if that thing was taking eight-foot strides through the woods when you saw it running, <laughs> that would explain why it w- went so it was so fast. Like it was um, it, it, when it ran. It, I mean, it wasn't like <sighs> if you could put Usain Bolt and make him seven feet tall or better, and have him have a little bit more spring in his step. That that's about what you'd have. You know, these but these I'm strides not, were, like I said, about eight feet apart. It was it was un, uh, unreal. I'm not out running a seven foot tall Usain Bolt. Even at my best, no. <laughs> even at my best. Day. So, I so five foot Usain Bolt on my best day. Yeah. So how did the um, so your dog? So your dog has to had to be pretty good size back then. He was. Yeah, he was. So how He's did probably one twenty five, one thirty five, something like that. So how how does how did his footprints compare to these? Size? Oh, there was no. The thing about it is these prints were elongated. They weren't just like dog. I mean, they were wide like a dog's okay. pad, but they were like, like they were a bit elongated too. Like I said, if you would look at that picture um, in the beginning of that film, that's about what these tracks look like. They were, they were, they were like a dog, but they were elongated too. It was, it was, it was strange. It was nothing like I'd ever seen. Because that night when I went there and that thing took off, there was not enough snow on the ground to, for it to leave tracks. The ground was frozen, but there was just a dusting of snow. There, you wouldn't have been able to see anything. Um, I didn't see anything. Um, nothing. Uh, I mean, I was, I, yeah. But in the snow, I did. So, so how did your, when you let the dog out, how did it act? Did it, act, did it go and like sniff around yeah, where? Come on. No, he didn't want to come out at first. When I opened the door and I, I told him, I said, come on, Wolf, let's go. No, he, he, he was, he was okay to stay in the garage for them. He didn't want to come out and I didn't force him. So I think that right there is, a, is, you know, and you know, your dog and you said oh, they yeah. love to be out in the snow and you, in the snow. and you think, oh my gosh, I've been in the garage all day. I'm going to run around in the snow. and no dog. I don't know a dog around that when you open the door, doesn't want to go run, <laughs> run it out unless. What? Right. Jeez, wow. So, so what time? So, how long then did it take? Because this is obvious, you know. And I knew talking to you the other day what an, what an effect this experience had on you. Okay, and yeah. knowing your background, your professional background, you're 
an analytical, evidence-based, scientific-minded person. Okay, so this this does not probably <laughs> register. You know, this isn't like this isn't supposed to be here. So, so how did the how did the process of you like coming to terms with this and kind of putting some pieces together as to what it was you had experienced go you know honestly shane um you know growing up where i did again it's a very rural community it's it's small uh and getting into i and i'm also a rescue diver um i spent a lot of time in the woods uh doing a lot of different things, all kinds of different things. And I was fortunate enough to be able to do a lot of different, a lot of different things to have the ability to have a lot of different career paths. But going out in the woods and just sitting there looking around, it gave me a whole new uh, insight because every time I walked out, I looked over my shoulder and I kept thinking to myself, it was it was very hard. It it took a long time to come with ter- come to terms with what I saw, because I kept thinking that couldn't have been real. That couldn't have been real. But the other part of me saying, well, it was real because you saw it, you saw the footprints, you saw it breathing, you saw its eyes. It was real. And when you analyze it that way, you have no choice but to either come to terms with it, or just let it stop you from being who you are. You know, I'm not going to let something stop me from, you know, taking a walk in the woods or go camping with my family or, you know, things like that. It's either come to terms with what's out there and try to be prepared for it or to stop. And I wasn't ready to stop. Yeah. I, I, I just, when it comes to these things, you know, and it's like you said, like, you hear a lot of Bigfoot stories in there. A lot of times it seems like Bigfoot, you don't see Bigfoot um, unless it wants you to see Bigfoot or you keep it or you totally surprise the creature. Okay. Right. Right. The, these things though, seem to thrive on scaring people, yes. you know, like, like they want, like they they get to feed off that fear that you're that they know you're gonna have when you see them, and I, and I'm I'm with you. I you know after we talked to Linda Gottfried, you're right. You, you know you really think there's there's something to the Native American aspect to this, and um, but but why are they just because if that's the case, then then we think that they are protecting the dead because when you go back and and trace the dog type creature thing you know all the way back to ancient egypt and anubis and stuff that's exactly. what they that's what they did so right. did did something happen along the way that they got they got like tired of the job and they're like we need to spice this up a little bit i don't i don't know it it just seems weird that if they want to keep you out of somewhere they almost draw you into that place just to, you know, just to scare you. You know, um, as far as a Native American approach from there, uh, Manistee, oh, hang on, let me get you back up there. Manistee, uh, Manistee Park up in Michigan, uh, the main road that runs through Manistee, I think it's Route 53, if I'm not mistaken. You still there? Yeah, I'm still. Yeah, okay. I'm still. Yeah, I think it's 53 that runs through there. That was an actual Indian trail, uh, and it turned it, and it became a main route. And there's been a lot of dogmen sightings just along that trail, along that road, that roadway. Um, the Native American aspect, you know, do these things? Uh, are they still protected? Are they more than that? Maybe they're um, protected of the land. You know, uh, you and I, I see by your picture, you went to uh, Point Pleasant, West Virginia. And, uh, you know, the uh, the uh, the thought was that, what was his name? Uh, Chief Corn- Cornstock. Chief Cornstock, Cornstock right? Yeah. Yep. Chief Cornstock cursed the land. Um, and that's where the Mothman came from. That's one of the theories, correct? So did a shaman put a curse on the land? We don't know. 
I mean, I don't think we know enough about the uh, the Native American legends or the folklore of this area well enough to say yes or no. I, I just don't think so. Where's effigy mounds that have been uh, you know, made by the Native Americans that uh, they're popping up here and there. There was one in a school not too far from here uh, that they found. It, it, just, it was sitting on the edge of a field that had been, been used for uh, planting, and it was just inside the wood line. So... Again, I don't think we know enough about the Native Americans uh, uh, in this area to say yes or no. Is it is it a curse? Is it something that they were trying to protect the land? Was it protecting a you know uh, the burial of a chief somewhere? Perhaps I don't I don't think we know. And and it would definitely I mean the Native American history with the you know, early American settlers in this land, a lot of it is not pleasant. You know, there's a, there's a lot of, and it's like that all over, but here, you know, there was some, some bad stuff that happened and I could totally, I could totally see, you know, that residue, you know, that paranormal type psychic, whatever residue hanging out in this area and just um, never going away. I mean, I don't know what's 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 going to make it. And you said, and that's what's weird is you know you said, oh, we don't know enough about it, which is str- we've we've been here for when did Ohio gets settled or statehood, eighteen oh three, something like that, yeah. and and we were settled. I mean, for four or five hundred years, seemingly right. we've been, you know, and it's not that we. I'm just going to say it's not that we don't know enough. I think a lot of people just didn't care enough to That's learn probably true. to learn what what was going on and what the culture and stuff was and um, what the belief system was because um, there's a lot of stuff we've probably lost by not listening to the people that were here before us uh, who right. who lived much in much more harmony with the land than we do. For right, sure. exactly. Exactly. And, and and the thing about it is, too, Shane, as you said that, um, we talk about going in the woods, the average person, they don't spend a lot of time in the woods only because they don't need to go in the woods to hunt for their food anymore. You know, you no. go 150 years ago, they were in the woods all the time hunting for food every day or every other day. You know, they hiked back and forth on these trails. There was a lot more things that they knew than what they do now. We talk about the spirituality of things and, and, and things that Ohio, some of the horrible things. Uh, Wheeling, West Virginia. Wheeling was actually known as Wheelunk, and that was uh, translated as the place of the skulls. Because once you crossed over into, into this place called Wheelunk, they had human skulls on poles to ward off people coming in. Kind of like, like I tried to do with all my daughter's boyfriends. Exactly right. Came, exactly. Came it's like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You put the, put the skulls on the pole. You're fine. You got it. But and, you, but you're, but you're absolutely right. Like, like where we live here, like, uh, like both of our, my wife's family and, and my family we have have farms. Okay. Across the field, my wife's, you know, they have 20 acres of woods. I've never stepped foot in. Right. Just because I don't, there's no reason I don't need to, you know, I mean, but if I needed to go, you know, if this was 300 years ago, I'd need to go in there and search for some squirrel or some rabbit or, or something, you know, right. to, to, to eat and, or even to cut firewood, right. you know? And, and another thing, you know, in the area that I live in, we're not that far from the firelands. Again, mm-hmm. it was a time of horrible, horribleness that, that they were set on fire and killed. We're, I'm not that far from there. It, it's it ranged all over the place. The Native American and the British, and they were setting people on fire. And you know, now far away from that, they could have been cursed then. Now, so, so this is the Native American aspect. So I'm going to ask you a question, and I know you can't, you can't get too specific, but you know, we we talked about your son, and, um. You know, he was in the military and right. um, 
So your son obviously knows the story. You guys have done some own, some of your own research in the field and stuff. Yeah. From his time in the military, d- did he ever indicate to you that these types of creatures or any of this other phenomena was anything that the military or the government may know about and just be keeping uh, keeping it from us? I mean, because, I mean, we know the government likes to keep stuff from us. But. Oh, yeah, they do. No, he never mentioned. He never mentioned. I don't know if he was privy to any of that, but it wasn't something that was in his uh, in, 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 in his MOS to know. So, no, he didn't know. He never mentioned. I just, he and I, he and I, he and I did do our own. Uh, we started doing our own research to new predators coming into Ohio. Uh, or predators coming back into Ohio. And we had some interesting things happen. Uh, um, the woods we were in was, it was May, a couple of years ago. And we were in there at dusk and there was absolutely no sound. There were no frogs, there were no, there were no crickets, there were no birds, there were nothing. Three miles up the road was a different story, but in the woods we were in, there was nothing. And he looked at me and he kind of gave me a little smirk as only he could. He said, you know, you know what that means, don't you? We're not the only predators in this woods. And when we went back the next day to get our trail cams, we came in a little bit different. And we were standing in, in what looked like a killing field, probably in a five to seven yard circle. There were five deer carcasses that had been, you know, the hides had been ripped off and it ate to the bone. And yeah. And it's like, oh, yeah, well, that's probably why we were it was very quiet in here. <laughs> and so so you guys are in there. What what do you think was the other predator? You know, like what does that what just it, I don't you know, I don't know a lot about I, I'm not a big hunter. But like I said, we live out in the country. My family's hunters and stuff. We've been out in the woods. I've never walked into the woods and seen seven deer carcasses ripped to sh- shreds and eaten right there. Like the eating is kind of a solitary kind of thing where it seems like the creature, like a, like an animal, a coyote or something's going to take, you know, take the carcass or whatever to where they need it. Not we all in the same place. We know in the area that we were in that uh black bear had come back in. We also know that, um, Wolves have started coming back in. Um, you know, these are, that's not to say that, you know, this is where they bring them back to to eat because it feels it's, it's where it, that's its home. You know, that's where it goes. You know, I, I can't say what was there. I, I, I have no idea. I don't even want to speculate because <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, it was a little unnerving as it was already. So, so, okay. So I, I know you said your girlfriend saw what she, you know, something similar to what you saw not that long ago. That's correct. Right. About two miles from here. What other than it just being like that, she, you know, since she's an empath, did she feel like, did she get a feeling from it? Was it something that she was able to read or feel or, or anything? You know, she said it was standing there like it wanted her to see it, but she got the same feeling from it that it was nothing but pure evil. And that was the, that was the empath in her. She was like, it was evil. There, she goes, I, I, and actually she said she felt drained. She said my energy felt drained when she, she got back to the house. Um, she was, again, she was very pale. She was very shaken, uh, needed a good shot to uh, take off the edge but uh, it was it was something that she goes she didn't doubt the things I had told her, and it being an empath, you know, and having this this ability to feel and sense things, she goes it was evil. She goes there is no question about it. She goes it drained. It took her a couple of days to actually feel like she had gotten her normal energy back. Yeah, and I I mean. Knowing some some empaths, evil like when they they're out 
maybe like doing a paranormal investigation, it seems like when they feel like they're in the presence of something heavy or dark, it will drain them, you know, and take them some time to recover from that and get their, and get their energy back up, which is, which is interesting that that's what she got just like driving, like driving by not well, like, she you know, well, oh, she had so, to stop because it was standing in the road before it was standing in the road as she approached and it went over and stood by the, by the bridges guardrail. So she actually slowed down because it was standing there and she stopped as it walked to the guardrail. So it was like, Hey, look at me. And she goes, just stopped and staring at this thing. She goes, it was, it was, it was, it was completely draining. She goes, it was unlike anything she'd ever seen. Yeah, I'm sure that's just a coincidence, right? Yeah. <laughs> that, that was just... Yeah, just, yeah exactly. <laughs> so, okay, so now, now armed all these years later with a lot more knowledge, well, as much knowledge as you know, you can get on this kind of subject. And I have stacks and stacks of books and read as much as possibly I can. Do you, do you yeah. feel like you would be better prepared to walk out the back door and come face to face with this, one of these things again? You know, I've had the feeling more than once that I was being drawn back into the woods by something uh maybe it i don't i don't know i i couldn't tell you for sure do i feel more armed with the knowledge that i have yeah and plus i'm also uh, better armed period um should i have the opportunity um do i want to see one i'm not going to go out and hunt one um uh, is there a possibility of seeing it again yeah there really is you know, there's many, many nights here in this small town in the summertime. You walk outside at 10 o'clock at night, 1030, and one side of the railroad tracks, you can hear the, the birds and you, or you can hear the crickets and the frogs and everything else. But where I'm at and behind me, there is no noise. There is nothing. And I sent you those pictures of what it's like mm-hmm. behind me. Yeah. Yeah, it looks, it, looks, it looks like looking out our backyard. You know, there's... Exactly. And there's nothing. There's no noise. There's nothing. There's no there's no crickets. There's no frogs. There's there's no noise at all. One side there is, this side there's not. It's like something's there. And it it wouldn't surprise me if, if I ran into it again. I gotta be honest with you, I think it's time to really start considering moving to Florida. Like, <laughs> uh, like getting out of the, getting out of that neighborhood. Uh, uh, you know, and 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 because I know where you're at, and I know it isn't very far away from where I'm at, right, and exactly. um, and it just, you know, every time I'm, I, you, you spend some time camping not too far from here, as I recall. Not too, not too far. Not yeah. listen. Not camp. I spent some time at the camp. <laughs> okay. I yeah. Camp. I didn't camp. Yeah. I didn't camp. I know enough to get out of the woods. Right. At, exactly. At night. But um. You know, I just there's something there's something going on when I when I told um, Phil, our producer, because um, he's in Ashland, what oh you know that I, that I was talking that I was talking to you and what where you were and stuff. He's like, oh, I can't wait to I can't wait to hear the, hear this <laughs> one. So oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right. because because we're working on a couple like uh, like um, you know I can't give away the one that's already in development, but it's like a don't, don't give it away. Don't give it away. It's a, but it's it's a werewolf movie. Oh, nice! Oh, yeah. You it's know, a <laughs> nobody's a nobody's seen it yet. If you haven't seen it yet, you, you got to go on Tubi and watch Dog Soldiers. If you haven't watched it, oh, that's fantastic! That's yeah. one the ju- That's one the judge told me. Yep. He told me about. He's like, man, you got to watch this, and it was that's a great movie. Yeah, you go in, you think, man, this is going to be kind of cheesy, and it's really, it's really, really not. Really but pretty good. To be honest with you, those it wasn't far off from what I did see. I mean, it was very similar in in what I saw. Mm-hmm. You know, when I saw these things, I'm like, oh shit. 
you know, I'm like, holy, you know, I'm like, I, I'm looking at this and thinking, yeah, okay, I'm going to watch this movie again. I'm going to watch it again. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to walk outside now and go out to the back. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> it's 11 o'clock at night and I'm going to take a walk in the woods. Let's wait just till tomorrow morning. We'll walk in the woods tomorrow morning. <laughs> Sounds better. Watch this movie. Let's not walk in the woods tonight. It's okay. You know, we're good. <laughs> uh, after, after remembering the eyes that I, you know, after, after looking at those eyes, after seeing it, after seeing it, uh, after seeing it take that breath and the steam coming out, it's out of its, out of its snout. And, and it's staring at me. I'll never forget that. And as I said, it, it happened, you know, winter of you know, December 2005 and January 2006. And I can see it all in my mind as, as if it happened yesterday. And you don't forget it. You don't, you don't forget this encounter. You, you can't. No, I, I, I have no doubt. No doubt. So, well, Brian, I'm, I'm glad you agreed to come on and share this experience. I mean, I think anybody in the right mind would be terrified. And I got to hand it to you. I wouldn't, I would have moved and never gone back in the woods. I just got to be I lived here all my life and it's like, well, I don't, I don't want to let anything run me off. You know, I'm not that kind of guy. Well, I think <laughs> if any, I, I think if you, if you get a chance to shoot it, shoot it and then run. That's all I can say is run. Well, you know what? I, 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 I well, I, I happen to have a flamethrower just in case, you know, <laughs> they don't like it. You know, you can, you can, you can train people and train animals to run into gunfire. I, unless you're wearing a, a, a turnout gear as a fireman, you're not going to run into fire. So I might have a, I might have a, a 50, 50 chance. Listen, I think, I think I'm going to have to pitch Phil on a new movie idea. The, the man with the flame. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, thank you so much. And just be careful. Be careful out there. That's all I can say. Every day. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of the From the Shadows podcast. Until next time, never shy away from the darkness or what may be lurking in the shadows. We are out. Ha 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 ha.